I believe it's time for us to begin this evening. I, I want to thank everybody for coming out. This, this is so nice to have this building this full, and we appreciate everybody coming. I know some of you cut it just a little bit close, Lawanda, but we appreciate it. You made it before we needed to start, so, and, and, uh, so I do appreciate everybody coming out with us. If you've not been with us before, bathrooms, we won't judge you. You go through the door. So, you know, it's a bit awkward to go forward when you got to go to the restroom, but through the door, through the nursery, and on the left-hand side is the bathroom. So that, that I wanted to make note of, and uh, that's a that's, uh, necessity. But we won't judge you if you get up and go during services. Um, the kids will do it all the time. <laughs> uh, Danny Allen's with us, and this is the last night of our meeting. And so that's always, the last night of any meeting is always bittersweet, you know? Sometimes you want to keep on going, but there's a sense of, you know, it's it's always, the kids are always worn out by the time the meeting's over. And last night, I don't know how anybody could sleep through Danny Allen, but I had a couple kids asleep. So anyway, if you haven't heard Danny, I think most of you have, but if you haven't heard Danny, fasten your seatbelt, you might need to stay put because Danny's going to be all over the place. So we appreciate that. If you care, and to Solomon in this final phase of his life, which actually covers about 40 years of Solomon's life. Um, maybe not quite 40 years, but we're going to cover, the Bible doesn't say a lot about it. He didn't do a lot of his spiritual writings when he was young. He did his spiritual writings when he was old. But if you in your Bibles, to um, 1 Kings chapter 11, uh, I just want to, I want to read a passage here in 1 Kings chapter 11. You know, he's a great example of, uh, of several spiritual principles that really are applicable to us today. Yeah, Solomon's an ancient king. He lived before we did, you know, and kind of my, my personal perspective in studying the life of these uh, kings of Israel in previous times has been that what do I want to learn from a dead guy? But Solomon here, I think there's some application for us and, and might actually give us some uh, 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 boost maybe. At least, it, at least it did for me when I was working on this lesson. So 1 Kings chapter 11, if you, if you begin with me, I, I want to begin in verse 1, but I want you to pay close attention to verse 6. It says, now, King Solomon loved many foreign women, among, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Amorite, Edomite, Sidian, Sidian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them. Neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn your heart away your, turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Amorites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. So I want you to, we're just going to pause right there. And that, that, that makes me ask a question. You know, when Solomon dies at the end here, you know, this of his life, there's not a lot more written about Solomon. We've looked at his great accomplishments. We've looked at his wisdom. And yet here is a very sobering aspect. You know, this is as, as if they're writing his epitaph because the book of Kings doesn't go on much farther in this. So what, when Solomon died, was he faithful to God? You really have to ask that question because of what is written here. So Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. 
So I want to take a very quick review. We're going to walk through it. I'm probably not going to turn to a lot of these passages. But I want to take a quick look at Solomon's life and then see if we can answer the question of whether or not Solomon died faithful to God. Because it doesn't do anyone any good to live a life to forego what the Bible says to forego in our lives. It doesn't do us any good to do that if at the end of our lives we're not faithful to God. It, it simply doesn't do us any good. So what is Solomon? Anybody, anybody have any ideas? You can nod your head. You have any ideas? Was he faithful or was he not? What do you think? Shh. You're not allowed to. You've heard this lesson. I think, I think it's an interesting thing. So David gives Solomon a, a charge to keep. Uh, in, in 1 Kings chapter 2, as Solomon is, you know, David's handing over the throne to his son Solomon. David wants to give Solomon uh, a, a, a boost into being a good king, a king that is faithful to God. And, and David simply says, 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 3, and we've read this before, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But David simply says, if I can find my verse, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all you do, in all that you do, and wherever you turn, that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons pay close attention to their way and walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart, and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. So that was a promise made to David that basically his descendants, if they, if his, if his descendants remained faithful, God would make sure that David's descendants remained on the throne in Israel until the coming of the Messiah. <clears throat> that, that is essentially what the promise was. But in order for us. David uses, David uses several terms. He says, obey God. Walk with God. Those are two terms that I think if we, if we think about those terms, will help to answer what David is stressing to Solomon. To walk with someone, there is a bond, a relationship. I don't care if, you just, if, you, if you're just out for a power walk at lunchtime, you know, down the Marietta, you see the bike path, and you see some of these ladies at lunchtime, they're out for that power walk. Well, if they're walking together, there's a bond. I don't care, I don't care. You can't walk with somebody without having a bond with that person. If you don't know the person, you don't have a bond, you're probably going to back off a little bit or go ahead a little bit. But if you're actually walking with someone, there is a bond there. So the idea that David is striving at is to walk with God. David wanted God to be real to Solomon. And I said this morning in, in, our, in our service at Second Street, which was not this lesson, but I said this morning, one of the greatest challenges as a parent is to make God real to our kids. He's real to us. I believe in God. But God is something that sometimes, in fact, I think to the world around us, God is not real. It's a concept that we talk about, but how do we convey the realness of God to someone else? The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, I'll go back there because it, it defines what faith is in, in very simple terms. Um, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 the English Standard Version renders it this way. Now, faith is the assurance, okay? assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Your King James reads very similar. The meaning is going to be the same. In essence, we're positive that something exists, but we don't see it. We don't feel it. God is not tangible. 
okay? We see evidence of God that leads us to believe that there is a God. But that doesn't necessarily make God real to us. What makes it real to us is having a relationship with God through obedience to his word. That's what makes God real to us. And we have to convey that to our children. So I think maybe that's where Solomon was. David was trying to make, make God real to Solomon to help him understand his need for obedience to have that relationship with God. Now in, in 1 Kings chapter 3, we see Solomon's response to David's plea for him to walk with God. Chapter 3, and uh, I'm, I'm going to, in verse, uh, verse 1, let's begin in verse 1. Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David. Now, there's, there's the first place we see in Solomon's life where he actually deviated from what David said. The Mosaic law strictly forbid the Israelites to marry. Now, again, we're under New Covenant law. We're under New Testament law. But Solomon wasn't. So in keeping God's command, Solomon would not have made, and this is simply what was done in that day and time, and to a certain point still is done in royal families. You know, they don't want to marry a, quote, commoner. They want to marry a king or a prince is supposed to marry a princess. It's only in modern times that royal families have deviated from that. And so the, the concept was, well, I'm not going to go to war with my father-in-law because I'm married to his daughter. That was part of the idea. That's part of the idea here between Solomon and Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So it says here, uh, until David had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem. So those were David's uh, major accomplishments as a young, or Solomon's major accomplishments as a young man. He says the people were sacrificing at the high places. However, because no house had yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon loved the Lord. Okay, he loved God. So, so right here in verse 3, Walking in the statues of David his father, only he sacrificed and made offerings in the high places. So, you know, until, until the temple was built, Solomon wasn't quite following everything he should have been following. But it does say that he loved the Lord. And I think that's where he deviated at. When his love for God grew cold, God was no longer as real to Solomon. It says he walked in the statues of his father David. That indicates that Solomon is following David. Not necessarily God. But he's following the pattern his father set forth. A lot of people, a lot of young people, you know, the kids come to church because they don't have a choice. I don't give them a choice. You stay home today? You know, I don't give my children a choice. Someday they'll have a choice and they'll be able to make the choice. And sometimes, I've seen this happen, sometimes young people go to church because it's habitary. They haven't yet made God real. They haven't made a relationship to them. They're simply following what they were taught. I think that's where we've lost a generation is because I think sometimes we just assume if we bring our children to church, that's enough. That seems to be what Solomon is doing, is he's following what David did, but not really having a firm foundation of his own faith. There is a note here, only he sacrificed and made offerings in the high places, which were, those high places were places where idols were at one time worshipped. Now he sacrificed to God, but it was, again, wrong location. It makes note of that. Now, the amazing thing is, 
And this is where God becomes real to Solomon. God does become real to Solomon. God appears to him in a dream. You remember studying that dream? In 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 5, essentially God says in this dream to Solomon, ask me anything and I will give it to you. What would you and I ask? What would you and I ask for? If God said we could have anything we want. I want you to notice here in chapter 3. and uh, Let's drop down to verse 9 and 10. Because Solomon asked for wisdom. He says, give your servant therefore an understanding mind to govern your people. That I may be discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this great, this your great people? Verse 10 says, It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have not asked this, have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall rise after you. And we study Solomon's wisdom. And even today, we talk about Solomon's wisdom. And he is mine. But this means that God was real to Solomon. And Solomon had a relationship of some form with God. But it, uh, again, I want you to notice something. There are conditions that God places upon the, the blessings that he's going to give to Solomon. In verse 11, he says, I'll find verse 11 for a moment. In, in verse, verse uh, 11, it says, And God said to him, Because you have asked, Ask this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, verse 12, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before you, but none shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor. So that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if, notice that there's two little word, two letter word, if, it indicates that there, there are parameters. If Solomon is to receive this blessing, he has to follow these parameters. And if you will walk in my ways and keep keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. God gives him wisdom really without a lot of parameters. But if you know right from wrong, I'm not sure you really need a lot of parameters there. You're going to set your own parameters, or you should set your own parameters. But God says he's going to give him long life if he follows him. Sometimes it's easier to instruct others than to make application yourself. You ever notice that? Anybody who has ever done any preaching or Bible class teaching, it's a lot easier. Jamie, you need to do whatever. Then it is to say, Tom, I need to do whatever. It's a lot easier to look at someone else and say, well, they need to straighten their life out. Then it is for me to make that application to myself. It's a lot harder to practice what we preach. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 8 here. Let's skip ahead a good bit in Solomon's life. But Solomon has done a lot of living. 1 Kings chapter 8 and... Uh, Oh, this, this is in his, his uh, benediction of the temple. Uh, down here quite a ways in verse 61. Solomon is even giving um, 
instruction to the children of Israel. After, after he's built the temple, he's making a grand national speech. Of course, today it would air on national television and radio and every news outlet would, would cover it. Solomon says to the children of Israel, he says, let your heart, therefore, be wholly true to the Lord, our God, walking in his statutes and keeping his commandments this day. I also want you to notice Solomon says, our God. Again, indicating that he has made God his own. God is real to him. So, when the Bible in chapter 11 of the book, first book of Kings says, Solomon did even in the sight of the Lord, and gives us all that reason. Was Solomon ignorant? Did he sin through ignorance? Did he not know any better? No. No. Solomon was a wise man. God gave him wisdom. God gave him understanding. God was real to Solomon. Therefore, we come to the conclusion. We have to come to the conclusion. Solomon willingly sinned. He willingly married 700 wives. I don't know what demented soul he might have been in that department. But there is no person, no man on earth in his right mind that would have 700 wives. Can you imagine the rivalry that would exist in that house? I'm not going there, by the way. So, Julie, you can rest easy. Um, Solomon just simply was not ignorant in his, in his life choices. Friends, do we ever make a life choice and know, going into it, know that it's not the right choice, but because it's something we want, we do it anyway? I do. I have. Now, I, I, I'm ashamed to admit to it. So we can be sure that Solomon's failings, the wrong that he did was willful disobedience. And that in chapter 11 is what the writer of the, of the book of First Kings is talking about when it says Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. It's that willful ignorance. You all want to back up for just a moment into chapter 4. And in verse 29 and 30 of 1 Kings chapter 4, I really think this kind of helps to seal the idea that Solomon knew. 1 Kings chapter 4 and down in verse 29, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure, and breadth of mind like the sand of the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the East and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all other men, wiser than Ethan, the Ezraite, and Hermon, and it goes on down through a list of other people that really mean very little to us today. He was wiser than anyone else. So his sin not a sin of ignorance. Here's the problem. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1. We read that verse. We read most of these verses. The problem is, is that Solomon's heart was turned away. Not only did he marry wives that he was not supposed to marry, but I want you to, I want you to take a spatial note here that Solomon also built temples. He built Places of worship for these, these women that he married. It also says in verse 4, when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, small g, idols. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God. Capital letter G. The same God that we serve. Now drop down to verse 7. Then Solomon built a high place for Emish, the abomination of Moab, for Molech, 
the abomination of the Amorites. These are idol names. Mol Molech is, is the idol, the national idol of the nation of, of the Amorites, Ammon. He built these, it says, in the, east of, in the mountains east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifices to their gods. Solomon knew better. Solomon knew that this was wrong to bring idolatry into Israel. Now, we probably don't have a problem with idolatry in our society today, do we? Mike's over there rolling his eyes like, oh boy, where's Tom going now? Okay, we think of an idol and we think of a statue or something in a building. Okay, yeah, we have some of that. You know, we, we, we seriously do. Go, there's, there's a Chinese restaurant in Marietta in the Lafayette Center. Their statue, their idol, their shrine is in the back of that building. Um, we also sometimes will see statues and shrines in other religious places. Those are idols. Make no mistake. But friends, an idol is more than that. The Bible teaches us that an idol is anything that comes between us and God. We're not going to go out and chase that sidetrack. But whatever it is that comes between us and God, I'll give you one illustration and I'll shut up about the topic. But my grandmother had a cousin who was very faithful in attendance. How, uh, actually, cousin-in-law. Howard, Howard was a barber and he was, he was there every Sunday. Real good guy. Except for two Sundays a year. Two Sundays a year, the Barber's Association had a golfing tournament. Now, I remember as a kid, just we're asking, we're asking if Howard was sick because he wasn't in church one Sunday. And I was told, oh no, the Barbers Association has their, their uh, semi annual uh, golfing tournament. And Howard went to that. I was blown away. I'm telling you, I was probably 12 years old. And you could have you touched me and I'd have hit the floor. The idea that someone would miss church to go to a golfing tournament was just blowing my mind. And I, and, that's just one illustration. It happened, it happened two times every year. I remember it from that point forward until Howard retired as a barber. It interrupted his worship of God. Now, I'm not trying to pick on, on Howard. Howard's still living, by the way. Don't, don't tell him I'm picking on him. Uh, <laughs> I remember that so vividly as a child that thinking there's something more important to Howard than church. And I was horrified. And I use that just as an illustration. You may not struggle with that. I certainly don't struggle with that. You know, I know we got some avid golfers over here on this side of the building. But, you know, to me, you get this little ball and you try to get it. Nah, that doesn't do anything for me. There's no chance I'm ever going to do that. But I'll tell you what, when I've got hay down in the field, and I know it's going to rain on Sunday afternoon before I get that hay up, it's awful tempting. You know, think about that. Am I going to lose my soul over 20 bales of hay or 50 bales of hay? That's a bad idea. Bad exchange. <laughs> Solomon did that very thing. He lost his soul over trying to keep his, or potentially lost his soul. We don't know the end of the story yet. He potentially lost his soul. He severed his relationship with God to keep peace with 700 women. That's really all it amounted to. Because he knew better. Okay, when Solomon's an old man, he writes he writes two books, which is an old, old, old man. He writes the book of Ecclesiastes and the book of Proverbs. And he writes them for a specific reason. First of all, the book of Proverbs is written to his son, who he hopes will become king of Israel when he's gone. And it would seem that he writes the book of Proverbs because he knows he's messed up. And so he's wanting to give his son something that he can refer back to and say, you know what dad said. You know, so he writes the book of Proverbs. And then right before he dies, he writes a second book called Ecclesiastes, which some Bible scholars say is a depressing book, and I would argue that. There are depressing aspects of it because Solomon is looking back at his life. We might call them memoirs. He 
He's looking back and he's live and he talks about everything he's tried. I want to go to Ecclesiastes right now, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And I want you to look at what Solomon says about his personal life up to the time he's an old, old man. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and in verse 1, I'm, it's a little bit long, it's 11 verses, but bear with me. Solomon says, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. Behold, this also is vanity or worthlessness. Vanity simply means worthless. I said of laughter, it is mad and of pleasure. What use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine. My heart still guiding me with wisdom. Now hold on, there's a little bit of a problem right here. Before we go any farther, I want you to know something. Solomon says, I wanted happiness. I wanted joy. So he says, he's looking, he's wanting to test pleasure. And he said that he tried to find pleasure in wine, in drunkenness, essentially is what he said. I tell you, if Solomon were around today, he'd be a cocaine, he'd try cocaine, he'd try whatever. I'm not saying do it. I'm saying this is the type of person Solomon experimented with things, trying to find pleasure in life. He says, I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine. My heart's still guiding me in wisdom. Now, again, that indicates to me he knows right, well, right from wrong, and he chose to do wrong just to try the pleasure of it. He says, how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man under the sun, or under heaven during the few days of their life. Solomon's wise, he realizes life is short, and he wants to enjoy it. He wants to he wants to experiment, he says. I made great works. I built houses. I planted vineyards. For myself, I made myself gardens and parks. Remember, he's a very wealthy man, the wealthiest in the world during his time. He said, and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. Now, if you read historians talk about Solomon's gardens to this day, there's a lot of archaeologists that look for Solomon's gardens. They were spectacular. They were amazing. And he sought pleasure in those things. He says, I bought male and female servants, and I had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. He expanded the borders of his kingdoms. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. I want to qualify right here. It's not wrong to have pleasure unless it's sinful. God sets a parameter for us. Solomon surpassed that. He says, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. He said, I enjoyed life. He says, this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done. So he says, I'll look back. I considered my life in the past, everything he'd accomplished. And the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity. All was worthless. In the grand scheme of things, it didn't amount to much. He says, Vanity and striving after wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. In another place in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, he says, I've worked so hard and I've built up so much wealth and so much kingdom. 
I'm going to leave it to someone else when I'm dead. Are they going to appreciate it? Ask anyone. You know, I, I think back and I think of I, I think of people that I've been with in the hospital, people who are dying, people who are nearing death. All those earthly possessions no longer mean a thing to them. Because they're giving them to someone else. Oh sure, we might we might make a will and testament, make sure we leave it to someone we like. It didn't go amount to anything. Solomon's looking back at life. You know, again, it's not wrong to enjoy life. Solomon, when he says he, he didn't hold any pleasures back from him, he literally meant it. And he went farther than, than what God allowed. God should always be first in our lives. Always. And God should have been first in Solomon's life. Again, nothing should separate us from God. In fact, bringing this into a New Testament Christian experience, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 puts it this way. And I think, I think what Paul is, is very confident. Paul has confidence throughout his walk with Christ that there's nothing going to separate him from God. And in Romans chapter 8 in verse 31... Paul says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, he was, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or peril or, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither, neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Bear that in mind. We may go through our ups and we may go through our downs, but nothing can separate us from God. We alone can make the decision to walk away from God. Solomon alone made the decision to walk away from God. The Christian's secret to success that should not be a secret at all is found previously in that chapter. What, why does Paul have that confidence? In verse 6, Paul says, I'm verse 6 here. In, in verse 6, Paul says, for to set the mind on the flesh is death. That's exactly what Solomon did when he talks about the vanity or worthlessness of his younger life. He set his mind on temporal pleasures, earthly pleasures, physical pleasures. The secret to success in Christianity for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. There is no man who's going to have peace with 700 wives. And I'm not, I'm not making a slide on any of our, our women here, Julie. Don't, don't go frown, Kate. You know, but it's simply a, 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 it's a simple truth. Paul says in verse 7, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And that's where Solomon, I think, was. He had a relationship with God. He knew God. And he chose to walk away. But in closing, we still have not answered the question, did Solomon die faithful to God? 
I think the answer is actually found in Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12. You know, we can't judge Solomon. Only God can judge Solomon. But what we have is what's written for us. And this, I think, gives us hope. It should give us hope if we have family, friends who have fallen away from Christ. Because that's exactly what Solomon did. He fell away from God. This passage gives us hope if we ourselves should fall away from God. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and in verse 13 and 14, the very last paragraph that Solomon wrote before his death. Solomon says the end of the matter. And I would encourage you to get out that whole book of Ecclesiastes and read it. You want to find out what's important in life? Read Ecclesiastes. It's my favorite book in the Old Testament. Solomon says the end of the matter is at hand. All has been heard. And this is where Solomon decided things were important. He says, fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Some of your translations might say this is man's all. But it means that it's, it's everything that man exists for. It will bring us happiness. It will bring us joy. Maybe not physical pleasure that Solomon saw. But it will bring us happiness, joy, and peace. He says, for God will bring every deed into judgment. With every secret thing, whether good or or evil. Solomon is trying in the book of Ecclesiastes to say this is what really matters. And he ends with that thought. I want to back up a little bit with one final thought that he penned in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 12. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times, Solomon says, and prolongs his life, Yet I know it will be well with those who fear God, because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked. Neither will he prolong his days like a shadow, because he does not fear before God. I think it was at the end of Solomon's life that Solomon realized the importance of life. But Solomon realized what David, his father, had been trying to convey to him at the very beginning. And so, based on what we read, I believe that Solomon returned to God. And I believe that Solomon died having a relationship, a right relationship with God. And that gives me hope. Because I don't know about you. I just... I have my up days and I have my down days. But it gives me hope that I can maintain a relationship with God despite anything I've done, providing that I do my very best to remain faithful to God. Get out your songbooks if you're subject to the invitation of the Lord.